Hello, everyone. My guest today is Maven Nisi. She is the founder and uh, sorry, she's the entrepreneur behind Cloud KPI, she, which is her fourth startup. Her latest venture addresses the frustrations involved in setting up and maintaining cross business metrics for SaaS companies, a segment growing to a multi billion dollar market value. Cloud KPI, which is raising a seed round, has completed programs at Plug and Play Tech and Women's Startup Lab. She previously founded Amos, Ireland's first digital marketing analytics agency, which exited in 2003, another one in 2015, and a fintech SaaS benchmarking solution called Market Finder. All right, Maeve, are you ready to take us to the top? I certainly am. All right, you're raising a seed round. How much are you trying to raise? And then tell us what the company does. Okay, so we're trying. We're raising a million. Um, and what the company does is, okay, so if you, you know SaaS companies. I mean, that's what you guys are all about, okay? Yep. And the, the really hard part about SaaS is that it re, you have to keep growing fast all the time. You've got to continue to grow fast to get to the level of revenues that's going to give you your profitability. Um, and to do that, you can't just look at your data in silo. Let's look at your revenue and your acquisitions and your sales and your marketing. You've got to join them together. So there are tools out there that allow you to build those integrations and allow you to try and build your metrics. But if you use Cloud KPI, all of that is done automatically for you. It's specifically designed for SaaS. So you, we literally plug into your existing systems, pull the data, visualize it, and then use predictive insights to say, hey, you know what's going to happen tomorrow in relation to your churn or your sales or your marketing. So You mean like you plug into like Stripe or the payment gateway, whatever? Yeah, and QuickBooks and Google Analytics and your product and your CRM. Okay, very interesting. And and you're raising a million. Are you doing a convertible note or a priced equity round? We're 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 open about that. At the moment, we're you know we're obviously we're negotiating with people, and we it looks like we've got a lead investor already, and that will probably be equity. That's great. Okay, good. And so, is this you've obviously exited a few companies? Is the company currently pre revenue, or do you have revenue? We've just literally released our first version of the product in June, and we already have revenue. We already have customers, and we have two big proof of concepts they're working on with some of those outsourced CFO services that service the, the SaaS business. Oh, that's great. Okay, so how many customers? You have one or two? We have three customers, and we have two proof of concepts, which okay. are separate to the customers. Yeah. And, and how much revenue do those three customers make up? Oh, uh, they in total, if we were to calculate them across the year, it would be, be 10,000. So we really are at the early stage. Got it. So ten, you basically have 10,000 in ARR right now. Exactly. Oh, I love it. We're right at the beginning. The baby is just popping out. This is beautiful. W yes. And if you knew how painful that is, you'd know that it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will not even admit to try and empathize with you because I have no idea what that is like. Um, but walk me through what they're paying for. So how are you pricing? So our pricing, we look, you know, like everybody else, is we've struggled with this one. And what we've come down to is the fairest way of doing it is we base it on their ARR. Um, and there's very good reasons for that because we learned very quickly. We, we did a lot of discovery with companies in the U.S. to find out exactly what's going on with SaaS businesses. And what we discovered is that in the very early days, your metrics are pretty damn simple, right? Just survive, know your run rate, get as many customers as you can. And then as you grow and grow and grow and grow, the metrics become more complicated. There's more data points. So that's why we've based it on the ARR, because the two of them reflect one another. And, and how do you see this as being different than like a bare metrics kind of concept? I suppose in a couple of ways, um, we would see it different because of the genuine plug and play self-service model that we are really chasing, because we don't want to be selling a whole lot of professional services to make this work for you. We want you to literally be able to pop it in, plug it in and use it. Does um, bare, and so, I'm not familiar with Barometrics. Do they have a big professional services thing? Or I thought you just connected with Stripe and boom, it works. Yeah, of course. Of course, there are, there are integrations that work like that. But ours are, are going across all of the different systems across the business. Um, and we concentrate solely on, on SaaS. So there's there are some differentiations around what we're doing. And, and tell me why you, and it looks like your your best friend, you guys have this great picture on your website. Uh, well, her name is Brenda, I believe, right? Brenda Jordan, yes. Yeah, why did you guys get into this? Well, why, why SaaS? Why software? Okay, because we had both separately, completely had two different worlds. I was working and building a digital marketing um, strategy company with a lot of analytics work that I was doing on behalf of clients. And separately, Brenda was, um, she had a big, management accountancy firm and she was doing the same around revenue metrics and both of us were using existing platforms that allow you build dashboards and we said this is really frustrating which ones what were you using i don't think i'm gonna i'm not gonna diss them because they're the very well-known names that you guys all know right okay and um, but they're not designed for they are dashboard builders they're not intelligent tools and we said why can't you have intelligence built into the solution so that the metrics that you need to calculate are already built in why do you think you there's a reason they haven't done that I think because their strategy is to go for a much broader market to start with, whereas we think it's better strategies to go for a vertical that's a very fast growth one. 
and then move into other similar verticals. So it's a different strategy, therefore it's a different kind of product. Yep. And also, you know, our whole premise is let's build in AI and predictive analytics so that we can look at a whole industry and start giving far bigger insights. And you can't do that if you're a broad-based pl- platform, it's too hard. How have you gotten these first three customers? Um, basically, we, we we got them in a kind of an odd way. We got them from pitching at different events that we were going to because we were very lucky. We got into some of the accelerators in Silicon Valley early on. Um, and when we were there, we'd meet people and they'd say, hey, I've invested in a SaaS company. You should talk to them. Or somebody would approach us at the end of the day and say, hey, listen, I need your product. So now we're really beginning to start working on our, on our ac- acquisitions. So it's going to be different, I'm sure, than the way we originally got the first customers. Um, but a lot of companies, you know, have started out with outsourced CFO services to help them generate metrics. Um, and those companies are desperate to find an automated way of doing that. So that certainly looks like a good route to market for us. Who are some of the largest kind of outsourced CFO firms that SaaS CEOs are using? Well, there's Early Growth Financial Services, which would be a very respected company. And, you know, it's in the States, but it's very What's big. What's it in called? Silicon. Early Growth Financial Services. Okay. Uh, another one would be a company called Escalon. Escalon. Yeah. Interesting. So these are yeah. again like fractional CFOs that you can hire. Exactly, but they're 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 pretty sophisticated in what they offer you. You know, they're doing financial planning and analytics. You know, uh, so they're actually getting stuck into the business and really looking at the metrics. And they don't see you as a threat. They see you as a tool that they can use. Great question. No, because what's happening is they're getting pressure from their clients to say, "Hey, look, why do we have to wait till the month end to get what's happening with the company? We need things live. We have to make fast decisions." So that's that's pushing them. They're also being asked for far more visualization in terms of how the information is presented. So that's pushing them. And then from their own side of things, in reality, those companies really want to be delivering higher end services and consultancy. They can't do that if they're stuck down in in, in the kind of dirty work of trying to get the metrics, um, you know, up to the top. So. It, it may not seem intuitive, but actually it is quite intuitive when you think about where the future is going anyway with automation. Security. I imagine if you're a software CEO and, and I go to your site and it says, connect your Stripe account or QuickBooks, I'm going, Ooh, do I trust these people? How do you make sure that like, you communicate, hey, we're not going to, data's not going to leak. We're not going to be hacked. It's totally safe with us. I mean, you know, our whole business relies on security. So we, we were very, very careful about how we built the platform to ensure that we cordon off access to information and make sure it's secure. But in reality, we found nobody's questioned that. And I know we're very early that things will change over time. But if you're desperate enough for an answer in a way, I don't think it's a barrier to using a solution. And of course, we have to provide information that gives them that confidence about how we secure the data. And I suppose being originally from Europe, where there's very, very strict laws around security of data, we've built a platform with those in mind. Um, and of course, that, that's going to happen everywhere. It's just starting in Europe. When but I did, think it's going to happen everywhere. When did you launch the company officially? Was it this year? This year. Okay. So what? how... Product- I launched this year. And and how much have you put into it so far in terms of money? And um, we have put in about 200,000 so far. We got some early angel investment originally. Okay. And and that 200,000, what's it being spent on? Is it developers mainly? Mainly developers, but actually we did something which is painful but very worthwhile doing at the beginning. We decided to really learn about the market because both of us have done products before. And if you go out, you know, with something that doesn't have a good match, not a perfect match, but a good match, you're just not going to get anywhere. So we did a lot of work of researching with SaaS companies in in Silicon Valley in particular to start with. Um, And then so obviously we spent money on that and then the product. The last question or may before we wrap up with the famous five, you're just starting, you have some proof of concepts. You're going to have to use all the negotiation power you have to get a valuation on this million that you're raising to make sure you guys don't get like diluted a ton. What valuation yeah. are you aiming for? And when you get pushed on it, how do you defend it? Oh, we are aiming for five. I think in reality, we're going to get pushed down to 3.5. Pre-money um, or know, post? I, pardon me? Pre-money, Pre-money. or Okay. Pre-money. And walk through again, what does that negotiation sound like? How are you, you know, they're going to say, you have no revenue, you're not worth 3.5. And you say, yeah, we're worth 3.5. Here's why. What's it sound like? Okay, so this is what it sounds like. Firstly, when we've got our first investment, we are valuing the company at 1.6 million. And at that stage, we had absolutely nothing. We had an idea. So that gives you a base. Since then, we've got a product. The product works. It's got customers and they're paying for it. But on top of that, we have had some investment from the accelerators that we got part of in Silicon Valley, and that's valued the company at, at, at the price we're looking at today. That's interesting. And and so what do you see yourself doing in four or five years? I mean, is, if someone came to you today and offered you a million bucks to buy that company, do you sell and go work on another idea or, or where do you see yourself? Uh, no, because a million bucks, is, this is a great opportunity, you know, so there's no way we're going to be selling at a million bucks. We do think what's really going to happen is we're going to have a trade sale in about five years. 
Um, you know, if we could go to IPO, we'd keep going. But I think in reality, for what's happening in the market now, it's probably a trade sale. What is that? What's a trade sale? I've never heard that. Well, sorry, that's probably a term that we use over here. It means that we'll be bought by one of the, the, the companies that we integrate with or that we add value to. I see. A strategic buyer. Exactly. A strategic buyer. <laughs> Very. We're, we're crossing the ocean here, Maeve. It's working. I'm feeling the energy. All right. Uh, let's... I- <laughs> I, thought, I thought I had managed to cross over that chat. I'm spending two years in Silicon Valley, but I, I, you know, you can't take the Irish out of me. <laughs> I hear you. Let's uh, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, it's got to be the Mom Test. The Mom Test. The, the Mom, Mom Test. The Mom M O M Test, which is a book to how you convince people early on to tell you the truth about your product, not actually what you want. they think you want to hear. Fascinating. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Oh, I, I always uh, watch Amazon. I mean, that's just the, the guru. Uh, I just follow him all the time. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building a business? Oh, God, that's a very good question. I think probably I use things like SurveyMonkey a lot to try and get feedback. Yeah, that's a good one. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Oh God, I wish I got eight, but I probably get six. And what's your situation? Married, single, kiddos? I am with a long-term partner and I have lots of kids. Okay. They're now over. <laughs> so not married and how many kiddos? I have three kids. Three. Wow, that's great. And do you mind me asking how old you are, Maeve? Uh, yeah. I do mind. <laughs> Good. <laughs> then, we, then, then we won't talk about it. I ask because I ask because my next question is, take us back to your 20-year-old self. What do you wish that she knew? Oh, I wish that she knew what I knew now, which means don't worry about things too much. If you have a good instinct and you know that you've got an idea, follow it and keep going. Guys, don't worry too much. There you have it. She's sold multiple agencies. She now, she's now going into SaaS analytics with her company Cloud KPI launched just recently, 2018, raised an early seed round at a $1.6 million valuation, currently raising a million bucks, aiming for a $5 million pre-money valuation. She thinks it'll probably be 3.5 million, which is fine. She's got three customers that are paying. They're doing about 10 grand per month in ARR. I hope she comes back on in a year and says, Nathan, we're doing a million bucks a month and I'm giving you 5% because you got so much customers from the podcast, right? Maybe that's how it's going to work. That's exactly it, Nate. (laughs) (laughs) Nate, thank you for taking us to the top. No problem. Take care.